house in uh, Fethiye in Turkey for a while, and she still has the negatives, which is why she's made me um, come to our team size. I'm Bruce Wilson. I'm just recently deputy CTO of Opera, but I'm going to be talking about responsive images today. And the reason I'm talking about responsive images is I was arguably the guy who first invented the things that are now um, gone into HTML and are available in all the browsers near you. Yeah, the brand link is my boss likes it. <clears throat> so th these are the new HTML thingies we'll be talking about. Pictures, source, set, the X descriptor, the W descriptor, and the size is attributes. <coughs> the first thing I'm going to do though is explain to you why we need these. Because whenever I do a talk like this, Somebody comes up to me and says, oh, you're polluting HTML with all this tricky stuff. Let's just do it in JavaScript and CSS. And you can't, so you have to use it in HTML. Um, everybody talks about responsive web design. So I looked at responsive in the dictionary. I didn't know what it meant. I just wanted to find a definition. Quick to react in the way that is needed, suitable, or right for a particular situation. So when a, a website automatically reformats, depending upon the device you're looking at it, it it's right <coughs> in a particular situation. But what we often forget about responsive is the first part of the definition, quick, quick to react. Speed and performance <coughs> is part of responsive. Uh, a 20% drop in traffic for a 0.5% delay, Google reports, 100 millisecond delay, with a 1% decrease in the sales, say Amazon. There's plenty more stats like that. Um, one second delay, 7% drop in conversions from Glasses Direct, five second improvement <laughs> in page load time, results in five to 12% increase in revenue. Shopzilla told us at the Velocity Conference in Santa Clara last year. If you don't want to take photos, that's fine because um, when I get back, or on Monday, I'll tweet a link to the slides on GitHub so you can get the information. You can take photos, that's fine, but you don't need to. The problem with images is that they are big. And of course, if you have a website that you're showing photographs or product images, you want them to look as good as possible because it's a proven fact that those convert people into buying stuff. The average web page, not websites, not web app, the average web page as of April last year, is two megabytes, of which 1.3 megabytes are images. So anything we can do to make images come down the wire faster means that your page renders faster, and if your page renders faster, you'll get more conversions, or if you're not selling stuff, you'll at least get more return visits. Whatever it is you're trying to do will be made better and more successful if you can deliver it faster. And there are more and more, uh, the, the images coming down the wire are bigger. This is a graph I made from HTTP archive. This is eight years worth of data. The number of images requested per page wiggles around the mid 50 mark. It started off as 50, 51, <coughs> now it's up to 55, 56. But the size of each image has increased enormously. And a lot of this is to do with what Apple want to call retina, or people who are not Apple fans will call high DPI screens. And it's, this has caused a problem. Of course, you want to send down images that look absolutely beautiful and clear on your <coughs> retina MacBook. But the trouble is, is that not everybody has one of those. So often if they're on a one DPI, not DPI, a one pixel density screen, there's a load of redundant information there that's taking up bandwidth, but is not being displayed to the user. So how can we do this? How can you send huge images to the devices that need them, but small images to the devices that don't, or even black and white images to things like a Kindle e-reader or an old Nokia M70? And the answer has been until now, you can't, because the humble image element in HTML takes one argument. <coughs> So I tried to do some cunning things. I tried with CSS, for example, to override that. So I have an image with an ID of lovely, and it was a picture of me in a mankini, hence the ID. And then what I, what I tried to do is say, on a narrow width screen, just replace that with this 
low res 19 in .jpg, and this works. It works in a browser that supports um, content without the before or the after pseudo element, which is Chromium and Opera. But unfortunately, you get what you don't want. Both get downloaded. So it's, you, what you're trying to do is replace the heavy download with a light download, and what you end up is both being downloaded. And the reason for this is complex, so we have to look deep under the hood of the browser. Um, can you show me your hands if you are not a postgraduate uh, student of compiler optimization? <laughs> Okay, we're going to get technical, so put your seatbelts on. But inside your browser, wait for it, is a magical fairy kingdom. <laughs> you still with me? Yeah. Cool. And it's ruled over by the benevolent fairy queen of the browsers. And she has a job. When you send out HTML, her job is to turn it into this tree called the document object model. And once this tree is assembled, the browser never looks at the HTML again. And that's why if you view source on a heavily JavaScripted page, the source that you're viewing bears no resemblance to what, what's actually on the page because the JavaScript and the CSS is applied onto the DOM tree. And this is a historical document that was just used to construct that. So it's in the browser's interest to construct this DOM as soon as possible. Because once the DOM is constructed, then the CSS can be applied, the JavaScript be applied, and only then can the browser actually start painting the page for your viewers to come and see. So this has to happen fast. In fact, it starts happening before all of this is downloaded. <coughs> but something else happens as well. The Fairy Queen has image helper elves. You still with me? <laughs> too techy yet. And as soon as the Fairy Queen sees an image tag, before she's even started to construct the DOM tree, as soon as she sees an image tag, one of these elves is dispatched to the server to fetch the image. And in the case of like a fast network or a very small image, you might actually have downloaded a number of the image assets before even this is displayed, and before this is even constructed. So by the time that I was trying to override the image in CSS, by necessity, CSS can only be applied to this once it's finished constructing, and it was very likely that some of these images had already been fetched by the helper elves. The only way to interrogate a device and then say, here are your different images you can use, is in the HTML, because it's too late by the time that you're in the world of CSS and JavaScript. This boring people who don't believe in fairies call this the browser preloader. And Steve Souders, who's a speed <coughs> expert from um, X of Yahoo and Google, he said the preloader is the single biggest performance improvement browsers have ever made. It came into IE and IE8, and it significantly speeded up um, page load by 17 to 20% across all the browsers. This is the kind of performance enhancement that, as developers, we can rarely reach. So what you don't want to do <coughs> is interfere with preloading. So I had a think, and I thought, well, how can we do this in HTML, and this is, a, this is 2011 when I was considering this, <coughs> and I realized a little known thing about the HTML5 video element is you could put a media query, like a media query, in the HTML. So this is perfectly legal <coughs> HTML5. If I only have uh, a screen that is narrower than 480 pixels, get me the low res video. Otherwise, get me the high-res video. So I thought, well, let's just steal this syntax and make a new tag. So I suggested we have a picture element. It couldn't be called an image, I-M-A-G-E. You try this at home. If you type in I-M-A-G-E, 
it acts exactly the same as if you typed in IMG, and that's in the HTML file spec. So I thought let's have a picture tag. Let's give it a media query, just like in the video tag. Have a bit of fallback content there, an image element in there for browsers that don't understand it, and we're good to go. And this was a, not a very good idea, actually. There's loads of reasons why this can't work. But luckily, in the web community, uh, there's an open source ethos, uh, at least it's a, a sharing and standards based ethos. So cleverer people than me looked at my idea and built on it. Uh, the Responsive Images Community Group was formed at the W3C. One of the first guys to work on it is a guy called Wilto, Matt, uh, Matt Marcus, who's a developer in Boston. A developer, not a standards work, a developer who also perceived this problem of wasted depth bandwidth. Then Marcos Caceres, a friend of mine from Mozilla. Tab Atkins, a friend of mine from Google. Simon Peters, a friend and colleague of mine from Opera. We <coughs> all got together to work on my initial not very good idea and make the real thing happen. And it worked, largely with the help of this guy, Yav Weiss. And Yoav is one of those guys who can not only program in web, but he's a C++ man. And he was in the evenings writing the C++ to add this into the Blink engine and the WebKit engine. But it was too big a task <coughs> to do in the evening. So what we did, we had a crowdfunding thing. We tried to raise 10,000 US dollars so that Yoav could take a few months off client work and devote his time entirely to coding the C++. We raised 15,000 US dollars, so he took X months off and wrote the code for Blink and for WebKit to get responsive images into the browser. It's like a perfect collaborative open source type story, I think. So what can the responsive images suite do for you? The simplest thing you can do is simply optimize for high DPI screens. So we have this image source equals normal.jpg. Any browser, any browser that you've ever seen in your career understands this. We have a new attribute called source set. And we say, this one, this high-res version, is suitable for screens that have two physical pixels per one logical pixel. That is, a retina device. And a browser that doesn't understand this just ignores that bit. It grabs normal.jpg just as they always have. Nobody gets a worse experience. But a browser that does understand that <coughs> will look at that and decide, am I a, a retina screen? If so, I'll grab that. Am I not a retina screen? Or do I not understand this new markup? I'll grab that and everybody wins. And you can extend that. So here I've said super high res is suitable for devices that have three physical pixels per one logical pixel. There are such devices. This begs the question, what happens if your device has two and a half, 2.5 physical pixels per CSS pixel? And the answer is, you don't know. And you can never know. You have to regard this <coughs> using this handy mnemonic diagram here of this suite, this calendar, and the composer list. You all understand this? Think of that markup as a candidates list, okay? Oh. It's a, thank you. It's a list of <laughs> candidates that the browser could choose from. But you cannot command the browser. And the reason you cannot command the browser is this is not you. You are not the browser fairy queen. <laughs> Most of you are not the browser <laughs> fairy queen. Because the browser knows stuff about the current environment that you as a developer <coughs> cannot possibly know because you are not in that user's environment. So for example, you might have uh, a super high density screen, but in some browsers, like the one my employer makes, you can say in the settings, only get me low quality images. And in that case, 
the browser would say, for the sake of argument now, I'm going to grab the lowest quality image I can, regardless of what my screen's capabilities actually are. And that's right and proper, because the browser is a user agent. It is serving the user. And if the user has said, don't grab any, any images, or always grab with the low quality images, that's what the browser does. The next thing that responsive images can do is stretchy images. <coughs> We're all used to doing this. Grab this picture, and its maximum width is 100%, and to preserve the aspect ratio, I've given it the height of auto. And that means that it will always fill the width. But the trouble with that is if you sent a giant image suitable for a wide screen, <laughs> and the user's only got a small screen, Yes, this markup will work, the image won't be cropped, it will fit to width, but the browser has to resize the image. And resizing the image <coughs> takes processing time, CPU cycles, and CPU cycles take up battery power. And it doesn't matter how bloody great your website is, if it hoses the user's battery, she won't come back to your website. So it's in your interest to preserve battery power on the device and not waste CPU cycles and heat the device up by making it resize stuff. A guy called Tim Cadlet did some uh, tests. On a test page with six times images, those are images that are six <coughs> times the expected minimum width, the combination of resized and decodes added an additional 278 milliseconds in Chrome and 95.1 milliseconds in IE, perhaps more, it's hard to measure. So you're delaying stuff, <coughs> you're heating the device up, and you're hosing the battery. So using responsive images, you can do this. What I'm doing is I'm saying, here's my source set. This one is, is 960 pixels wide. This one is 240 pixels wide. And then the browser can choose the one it wants. You have to put this in the markup because it has to be seen right at the beginning by the browser preloader. It's ugly putting this stuff in the market, but it's the only way to beat the preloader. Oh, and you must say, sizes is 100 VW, that is 100% of the width. I don't really know why. If you don't put it in, it's assumed anyway, but the validator will complain. And you can change image sizes. So here I'm saying, Here's an image. It's the Oslo Opera House. If my minimum width is 640 pixels, that is, it's a wide screen, if it's larger than 640 pixels, then show the image at 60 viewport width units. That's show the image at 60% of the width, so you can float stuff <coughs> on the other side. If this is not true, i.e. it's a narrow screen, show the image at 100% of the viewport. You can do that there. And then here is my list of different images. That one's 200 pixels wide, that one's 800 pixels wide, that one's 1200 pixels wide, that one's 2000 pixels wide. By giving the browser this information, the browser is able to make the best choice at any time about which one to grab and what width to show it to. Another use case, because I'm rapidly running out of time, Sending different image formats. Most images on the web are JPEG, PNG, or GIF. None of them are GIF. 47% um, <laughs> of images used on the web, according to HTTP archive, are JPEG, 29% are GIF, 2% are other. And the reason for this is that the only formats you can be sure every browser understands are those three. But these are, these are actually quite old-fashioned formats. There are new formats available that have better compression algorithms, so for the same image quality, you can get much smaller images uh, in file size terms, but we don't use them because not every browser universally supports them. So one of the things we added to responsive images is the ability to switch formats. I like the WebP format. This is uh, the still version of the WebM video format that Google bought and then open sourced. It's a later generation version of Ogfior. And WebP lossless images are 26% smaller 
compared to PNGs, and lost images are 25 to 34 percent smaller. <coughs> this is so significant that in Opera, the product, that, the company that I work for, in desktop and the Android product, you know, there's, a, there's a possibility to turn on turbo mode. And one of the things we do is on our servers, we transcode PNGs and JPEGs on the fly to WebP because it's faster to transcode them and send the smaller version down the wire than it is to send down the rather bloated JPEG or PNG. That's an aside. So, in HTML5 video, you could always do this. You could say, if you know how to play a WebM, take the WebM. If you know how to play an MP4, take the MP4. So, I stole this. And now you can say, picture elements. Here's my source set, tree.webp, and I'm telling it it's a webp image. You can't rely upon the file extension. We all know that JPEGs can be JPG, JPEG, etc. So we tell it here when it's official mime type. So what this says is, here's a picture, and this is just a wrapper. Here's a potential image, uh, image candidate, and it's a webp. And the browser thinks, do I understand webp? Yes, I do, I'll use that one. If the browser doesn't understand WebP, or if the browser is IE 7, 8, 9, and doesn't understand picture, it will grab this, like every browser since the dawn of time has, <coughs> grab the JPEG and show it. Nobody gets a worse experience, and people with a more modern browser get a better, faster experience. Faster because it's 33% smaller. And if you think about how many images you might have on a page, that's significant and with the same. <coughs> Picture is magical. It just magically changes logically. It tells the fairy queen, actually don't grab the thing that's in the image SRC attributes. Here's another list, grab something from here instead. But the image element, the picture element, will never work if you don't have the image SRC. And that's by design. What we didn't want is people using the picture tag and forgetting about the image element and not showing anything at all to old browsers. People with older browsers often don't have them by choice. They can't move. <coughs> so this forces you always to take account of backwards compatibility and show something to older browsers. Art direction is the last and the most complex. Oh, I've got plenty of time. It's two minutes. Oh, I didn't say two minutes. That's the time. It's two hours seven. It's such an idiot. <laughs> <laughs> I thought it was counting down really slowly. <laughs> Art direction is the last use case. And this is the most complex use case. And one that I don't actually use because, and this might shock you, I am not a designer. I'm a developer guy. Um, but designers like designing things and they like making sure it's good. Any designers in the room? Designers are great people. And they, deserve, <laughs> they deserve this use case. Um, so, for designers, they want to do this. You don't want to shrink down pictures. Sometimes you want to do art direction. So on a widescreen thing, you get a picture of this horrific looking dog in front of the White House. On uh, a landscape uh, tablet, you might want that. On a portrait tablet, you want that. And on a smartphone, you want to zoom in on the beast's horrible, drooling, rapid fangs. <laughs> Dogs, eh? Sorry. Um, but you couldn't do that before. But you could with some stupid JavaScript, but then you were having multiple downloads because the browser preloader had already grabbed an image. <coughs> it was all very brittle. Now you can do this. You can say, here's a picture element. It just wraps around all the different image candidates and the image elements. If I'm wider than 1024 pixels, that is, I have a minimum width of 1024, so I'm above 1024. Then grab the full shot. Otherwise, fall back to the image elements, which always has to be there for older browsers, grab the close-up. 
And you can extend that, of course, you can put in as many different media queries as you want to, to send as many different images as you like. You can have a media query saying, if you're monochrome, and then grab a black and white image, which is, because it's got no color information, it's smaller in file size. I haven't shown that, you can do it if you want to. You could, have, you could use the media query that asks about the ambient light and send a brighter image to some devices. It's kind of probably a bit daft, but you could do it. You can choose what you do. In summary, responsive images has to be in the HTML. There is no way to do it in CSS or JavaScript because of the browser preloader, the fairy queen. The markup is, I admit, ugly, but it works. These are words that will be written on my tombstone. <laughs> ugly, but works. <laughs> And there are four different independent use cases, but you can combine them together into one massive, terrifyingly ugly picture element if you want to. I haven't, because I want you to use this, I don't want you to be scared off. And also it's more complex to explain in 30 minutes. But the main use cases are resolution switching. That is simply sending down high res images to retina displays, low res images <coughs> to non-retina displays, and potentially monochrome images to things like uh, ebooks. Then you have width switching, when you can say, if you're above this size, show me 60% of the viewport width. If you're below this size, show me 100% of the viewport width. You have alternate formats. This is really handy, and you can do this right now today. Just in part of your build process using Gulp or Grunt or Broccoli or whatever the latest cool thing is. Just build it a step where every image gets transferred to PNG, uh, to, to WebP as well. Stick that on the server, copy and paste, and use the resolution switching stuff that I showed you before, and you will instantly save 33% on all your images. And then the most complex art direction when you're actually sending differently cropped versions of the same shot to different devices. When can you do this? You can do this now. In fact, you can always do this now, even 10 months ago when it was only an Opera and Chrome. We built this deliberately so that nobody would get a worse experience, but people on the more modern browsers get a better experience. But you actually genuinely can do this now. It's in Opera, it's in Chrome, it's in Firefox as of May last year, it's in Microsoft Edge. Um, Martin said it's either in or just about to be turned on. I think I believe it's actually in Microsoft Edge. And in Safari on iOS, the source set X descriptors are there. That's the one that chooses about screen resolution. And it's not surprising it's there because Apple invented that particular bit. And the picture element and everything else is already coded into WebKit, but as we know, Safari only gets updated every time a member of the royal family dies or something. So, <laughs> so you have to wait for it actually to get into the browser. But the point is, if Safari doesn't understand it, it will just show the thing pointed to by the good old-fashioned IMG element. Nobody will get a worse experience, and people with a more modern browser get a better, faster experience. And if they get a better, faster experience, you will get more customers and your bosses or your clients will erect a 40-foot statue of you in the car park <laughs> and give you a Lamborghini, and that's guaranteed. <laughs> or I will, give you, I will give you all of my speaking feedback. Um, it's using The Guardian, it's using loads and loads of websites. <coughs> Patrick Hamm from The Guardian said, been using it for two weeks now, and this was March last year with no issues, um, and he did tell me how much data they saved, but I can't pass it on, but it is a staggering amount of bandwidth the Guardian saved, because a big site like that, bandwidth isn't cheap, and think how much of their users' bandwidth they saved. But most of all, it's progressive enhancement, because responsive images require the use of the IMG element. Nobody gets a worse experience than this. <coughs> This is the way standards should work, and that's why when we were building this, we built it from the ground up to include everybody. And they all lived happily ever after. Thank you for your attention.